Uh, so, yeah, as you can see, I'm Hugh. Uh, I'm in computing. And uh, I've had a kind of long time interest in puzzles in general and pencil puzzles in, in particular. And I've also been working in the field of computational intelligence. So I'm just going to show you a bit of work that um, combines the two. So um, I'm going to first of all talk about what is computational intelligence. It's a kind of a term that has a, it has a definition. And according to the IEEE definition, it's uh, something which uh, is computation that's inspired by natural processes and uh, language. And it, according to their definition, has three pillars, which are uh, neural networks, evolutionary computation, and fuzzy systems. So uh, I'll go into what all these are. Neural networks are very kind of fashionable at the moment, mainly because they include deep learning, which is uh, the very hot new AI technology. And it's kind of interesting thing that neural networks were around for a very long time, not really doing very much until um, people realized that you could actually run neural networks very quickly on gaming hardware, on GPUs, and thus uh, deep learning was enabled, which is basically just neural networks, but very big ones, very deep ones with lots of connections. So weirdly, um, the gaming industry actually enabled that, that field of AI research. And now NVIDIA are driven not by the games industry, but by the AI industry instead. Fuzzy systems, they, um, I mean, most of the people who were working on that are now working on this. And evolutionary computation, that's um, algorithms that are inspired by the process of evolution. And there's various, uh, there's three main strands there. There's a thing called genetic programming, which is where you, you try and evolve programs. So you take two programs, you breed them, you produce a new program, you, you see what it does. So you start off with simple programs that do nothing, more or less, and eventually things that are useful emerge. Um, genetic algorithms and evolutionary strategies, they're more or less the same thing. They're kind of evolving the data rather than the code. And they are, uh, the main difference is uh, genetic algorithms tends to be discrete data, um, categories, integers, and evolutionary strategies tends to be real numbers. And another thing which has kind of emerged from that, it probably should be joined there as well, but it's usually lumped in with evolutionary computation, is the whole area of nature-inspired computing, which is looking to nature and trying to mimic these natural processes and developing algorithms from those. And there are a few types, main categories here. There's a thing called swarm intelligence. Swarm intelligence is what I mostly talk about today. That takes behavior from natural um, swarms of simple creatures that seem to display behavior as a swarm that's more intelligent than the, uh, the elements. So ants, for example, is the classic. So a termite nest is actually quite a complex, intelligent thing, but the individual termites uh, are pretty dumb. So we've got artificial bee colony, particle swarm, and ant colony optimization. So I'll mainly talk about ants. And then we have uh, things that are inspired by physical systems. There's a thing called simulated annealing, which uh, mimics the way that uh, when you have a cooling metal, that it kind of settles down to the lowest energy configuration. It does this by bumping around um, the sort of um, local potential wells. I hate to use a term like that, a physics term, but um, the idea is that um, natural sy physical systems seem to be able to find this, this minimum value so we can um, mimic that behavior. And then finally, there is a category I've called silly. And recently people have come up with a lot of in fact, a lot of journalists have now said, no new nature-inspired algorithms, please, because they're <laughs> absolutely sick of it. Uh, I've put two here. One I saw recently, which was uh, an algorithm apparently based on the natural swarming behavior of donkeys. And I didn't know they did that. <laughs> and included, as an effect, the fact that donkeys occasionally commit suicide. I didn't know that either, but there you go. And I've got one there with jazz musicians. Um, this is a bit of a, it's a, bit of a cause celebre. There's an algorithm called Harmony Search, which is based on jamming jazz musicians. Uh, somebody a while ago showed that mathematically it's identical to this evolution of strategies. So we should stop calling it anything to do with jazz. But uh, that's been a sort of ongoing battle. So there is a kind of a whole industry of looking at something in nature and saying, oh, we can make an algorithm based on that. But most of them actually boil down to the same uh, sort of half dozen sort of simple processes. All right, so that's where we're going. Uh, there is also a new, quite exciting field called neuroevolution that I'm just beginning to tinker in, and that is where you use evolutionary computation to evolve neural networks. So it's a kind of a bit like genetic programming, but we're evolving networks rather than, than programs. Okay. And finally, just what these things get used for. All these things here are more or less uh, in the classical domain of AI and machine learning. Uh, machine learning is learning from data, 
what you're learning to do usually is classification, which is um, telling cat images from dog images, and a thing called regression, which is using data to predict some value. So the classic one there is you get all the data about some area and you predict the house price, that sort of thing. Okay, and these things over here, they all do a thing called optimization. And what optimization is, is given some, some space. So that could be um, three dimensional space. It could be usually in big data, you're talking about hundreds or thousands of dimensions. Given th that space and some function where for each point in the space you assign a value, how do you find the point with the lowest value? So what that's about is things like, let's say you are trying to timetable something, then you can assign a value to this timetable as being better than that one. And uh, so you search the combinatorial space, all the permutations of things, you come up with the best timetable. So that's called optimization. Right, so that's uh, evolutionary computation and uh, computation intelligence. So pencil puzzles to lighten the mood, mood a bit. So um, these are some Japanese pencil puzzles, uh, all of which um, I think apart from Sudoku are all down to one company called Nicoli. They used to publish a magazine called Nicoli Puzzle Communication, which is a really nice magazine if you can get it. And all these puzzles um, are dreamt up by the readers. They'll send in ideas for puzzles and then the setters will um, get the hang of them and start producing them. And they, they tend to produce really nice puzzles that when you solve them, you kind of can see the hand of the setter. Whereas a lot of the British newspaper puzzles tend to be computer generated and a bit sort of dead. But uh, Anumikabi, for example, there's what, you know, you look at this sort of black and white grid, but I do remember one Novikabi where when I solved it, I laughed out loud because it was so, so witty the way <laughs> I'd been led down this exact path to the solution. So uh, they, all, they all have fairly simple rules. Uh, they, they all have, they're all very international. You know, as long as you understand Arabic numerals, you can solve them, unlike a crossword. So I'll, I'll give you a, everybody knows Sudoku. Uh, so this is one that I quite like, it's called Hashi Waka Kero. Uh, call it Hashi. So every one of these uh, blobs here has to be joined by lines. And if a blob has the number three in it, then that means there are three lines connected to it. And then the extra rules are the lines can't cross. So as soon as I, if I was to draw that one, uh, I need to get the right angle. If I was to draw that one there, for example, then the one across is, is barred. And all the lines have to form a continuous path. So you can get from any one blob to another one. So that's quite a nice one. Nuikabi, uh, that's a shading puzzle where you start off with a grid with numbers and you have to shade out black squares so that the white squares form islands which have the number of cells given by the number. The islands can't touch. Uh, in the world of Nicoli, by the way, that is not touching. Diagonal touching doesn't count ever. And the black squares have to be fully connected so you can trace a path through them and you're not allowed two by two blocks of black squares, which are known as pools in the river. Uh, so that's uh, that's quite a nice one. Um, Futashiki, a bit like Sudoku, but the extra clues are these greater than signs and so on. Okay, that's probably enough about them. Um, but the thing about them is, as well as being really um, good fun, and they, they come in different categories like shading ones and line drawing ones, and you tend to find you'll solve half a dozen line drawing ones, then your pencil is blunt, so you do the shading ones. <laughs> and then you do that, then you sharpen your pencil and you come back to the line one. So it's very nice, very kind of uh, tactile, I guess. So th the reason these are interesting to uh, someone like me <laughs> is that, um, and where the two things come together, is that they are hard problems, but they're hard problems in a very technical sense. There is this thing called complexity theory, uh, the theory of uh, computational complexity, and it's to do with complexity means how how much harder something gets to solve as the problem gets bigger. And you may have heard of this thing called the P versus NP problem. Uh, it's one of the great unsolved problems in, in maths. So whenever you talk about it, you always show two cases. If P is not equal to NP and if P equals NP. 99% of people think this is the case. But in any case, we, ha we, we can classify problems according to their complexity. P are problems that are quite easy. That means as they get bigger, the way they scale goes as as a power. So let's say I have a problem that has an input size of 10 and then I double that to an input size of 20, then it's going to get twice as hard or two squared as hard or two cubed as hard. Okay. These ones here, NP, um, these are harder than that. So they scale exponentially. 
the ones that are NP complete are the hardest of those. And then there are these crazy ones called NP hard. And the difference between NP hard and NP complete is an NP complete problem is very hard to solve, but once you've solved it, you know you've solved it. It's very easy to check the solution. NP hard are hard to solve and it's hard to check the solution. So they are um, extremely hard indeed. So they're things like traveling salesman problem. So pencil puzzles are in this NP complete thing. So they're very hard to solve, so they're interesting to study, but they have the convenient property that it's easy to know you've solved it. So you check a Sudoku, you just look at the rows and columns, you know you've solved it, okay? And it just turns out that this class of problems is exactly the class of problems that most of these nature-inspired computing algorithms are designed to solve. So we thought we'll combine the two and see what we find. Uh, so the one I'm going to talk about most is the thing called ant colony optimization. So this is a nature-inspired algorithm. It's not a silly one. Uh, it, it works really well. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's based on a thing called stigmergy, which is a biology word, which is um, a natural process of communication mediated by the environment. So ants do communicate, but they communicate by leaving trails of pheromone. And uh, other ants can pick that up and follow it, but they have to be there. So it's, it's global in the sense that the whole colony is communicating, but it's very local in the sense that the ant has to be where the smell is before we can follow it. Um, so there is a classic experiment, it's called the double bridge experiment, where you get um, a nest of ants, you get a source of food, and you set up some paths for them to walk on. And if you make these bridges and make them of equal lengths, you find that the ants will eventually settle on one of the two paths, but it's kind of random which one they'll settle on. If you make one of the paths a lot longer, you'll find that they are pretty much always settle on the shortest path. And the reason is, it's to do with returning ants. So a returning ant with food will find its way back to the nest and lay pheromone. And if, a returning, if the first ant to find food comes back this way, it's going to lay pheromone on that track. If another one at the same time goes down here, that ant isn't going to make the end before the first one. Meanwhile, other ants are coming here, picking up that trail, and the whole thing just then reinforces very quickly. You get a kind of runaway positive feedback. So the ants eventually settle on the shortest path. So this is um, exploited in ant colony optimization by... Uh, so this is a... In, in maths, what we call a graph is not what most people call a graph, which is, you know, a wiggly line. It's actually um, a structure where you have a set of vertices joined by edges. And Ant colony optimization works on graphs. You cast your problem on a graph, and then you imagine little ants going around your graph, taking these edges, moving from one to the other. And then once they finish their, um, <coughs> their traversal of this graph, which is somehow constructing your solution, they go back and put pheromone on the edges that they just walked along. And the idea is that as that simulated pheromone builds up, even though the ants are making kind of random decisions, eventually the shortest path emerges. Okay. And what you do is every time you reach one of these uh, decision points, the ant will choose which way to go based on how much pheromone is on each of those edges, but it'll do it randomly. So um, there is room to kind of search the space. Okay? So you kind of cast your problem as this, this abstract thing. Some problems naturally fall into that, things like the traveling salesman problem or routing, where you're trying to find the shortest path from, uh, along the street network or whatever. Okay? Right, so that's ACO. Um, so we did a bit of work on this. So I did this uh, last, well, I did it a while ago, but we just wrote the paper last year with Martin Amos, uh, once of this parish. Some of you may, may remember him. And so we uh, tried solving uh, Sudoku with ant colony optimization. So the reason I did this in the first place was this paper was published. Um, that's actually 2017, it's not 2016. Somebody uh, had this. Uh, algorithm called iterated local search with a thing called constraint propagation and they came up with um, some results to show we tested it against various things this is actually the best way to solve sudokus it's very very fast so I thought well you know we'll see about that I'll see if I can do better with with ants which we did and it <laughs> turns out ants are very good at this so I kind of regret that we did did it that way around because I think that was actually the wrong approach you know who can solve sudoku the fastest it's a little bit pointless but you know that's the way it went so um I'll talk a bit about the results in a minute, but we got this into the new journal IEEE Transactions on Games. So we were quite pleased about this because it's a new journal. It's, uh, it's about games. It's about all sorts of aspects of games. And so it's only been going a couple of years, so we're quite keen that if we get something in here, we can establish 
pencil puzzles as a valid thing in scope for this journal. So hopefully we've done that. Um, so the idea is, what we found was then, if we look at big instances of Sudoku, and these are 25 by 25s, and I've got a plot here of the success rate of the, so that's ACS, that's ours, so the success rate. You'll see, you, you get this weird thing, it's called a phase shift. So um, it turns out that, so these are actually general instances, there isn't a unique solution. Uh, it turns out, if you have a lot of givens, they're very easy. If you don't have many givens, they're also easy. But around about 40%, 45% given cells, they get very difficult, very suddenly. And we find that uh, our algorithm solves about 85% of those. Uh, iterated local search is down here at about 10%. And these two here are kind of direct solution algorithms. Um, we also found that it was quite fast at solving very hard human solvable instances. So. I don't know whether you recognise these names. These are famous hard Sudokus. So, uh, Platinum Blonde, Golden Nugget, Red Dwarf, Tarx 0134. Uh, look those up. Try and solve them. <laughs> 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 They're very, very hard. <laughs> so, if you use your usual strategies that you use in the metro, you know, you won't get very far with these. I mean, I certainly didn't. Um, and so, you know, these are times it takes the ILS algorithm, like about best part of a second to solve that, whereas otherwise does it in 25 milliseconds. Okay, so it's very fast at solving Sudokus, which is pleasing. So the conclusion was ACO is very good at solving hard Sudokus. So far, so good. So we then tried uh, Nomikabi. And by the way, I'll stop this after this. We didn't then do using our college optimization to solve Hashiwaka Hero, then Slytherin and so on. So we, we are going to try and do something a bit more uh, general after this. So we tried Nurikabi, uh, and on the face of it, they're fairly similar. You know, if a human sits down and does a Nurikabi, it's about the same. It's about the same difficulty. So these these are all puzzles designed for humans, and this time we compared against this state-of-the-art uh, constraint propagation solver called Copris. It's a thing called a SAT solver. It did kind of industrial strength optimization code, and we found that uh, our ant colony alg algorithm could keep up with this on the small instances so this is fraction of success against instance size and then but it falls away a lot quicker than the other one so once you get to an instance of about 200 cells it is starting to struggle um, these are the solution times this is a log log plot so this is really kind of random scatter so everything below the line is where everyone is doing it quicker everything above the line is where it's doing it slower and you can see that actually on the small ones um, it again is solving it very quick in sort of few uh, milliseconds compared to a sort of minimum of a second for the other one. So, um, you know, this wasn't as uh, interesting a result, I guess, which is so sort of why we got it into a conference rather than a journal. Uh, but I guess it is interesting that ACO was very good at solving Sudoku, but ACO was not very good at solving Noikabi. So there's something going on there, something, some difference in the way these um, puzzles are, are constructed. Uh, and by the way, some of these things it totally fails to solve uh, up here which both of them totally failed to solve, they are things that if I was to sit down with a pencil for 20 minutes, I'd probably get them. So there's something that humans are doing that these things are failing to capture just by trying to apply rules of logic and uh, searching a space. So that's kind of interesting. and I, I hope we'll find out more about that. Right, so we moved on to another thing. And how am I doing for time? Pretty good, I think, yeah. Um, so we thought, okay, let's, let's do something more general here and let's look into this um, in general. So we came up with this idea, um, which we're, it's kind of work in progress. So Martin, uh, for those of you that knew him, he was a professor here, he's now at um, Northumbria. So he's got, he's actually recruited an army of MSc project students who are going away now implementing different puzzles for us, so, which is fine. And um, we've come up with this idea, we thought, well, What's, what we were really doing with these search algorithms was we were sort of looking at a puzzle and we were asking our ants or whatever, uh, okay, we're in this square, there were three options, you can choose a two, a six, or a nine, what's it going to be? And it says, okay, I'll have a nine. And then you move on to the next square and it gives you another set of choices. So we thought, if we can kind of abs abstract that and instead of saying you're in square 10, choose a two, six, or a nine, you could just say, choose Bill, Bob, or Alice and then it just becomes a completely abstract thing. But we can do that by taking the options that you encounter in solving the puzzle and then kind of encoding them in a unique ID that will tell you on the puzzle side what that means. So we would encode it as some number 
but actually in context of Sudoku it means put a 9 in cell 10 okay so we came up with a kind of interface which we called it starts off being called the simulator I now call it the oracle because I think that sounds cooler <laughs> where and it's a it's a bit like the um the that famous thought experiment of the Chinese room where things are being passed into a room somebody's looking up some drawers passing them out and the idea is that you know it looks like the room contains somebody who speaks Chinese but actually it doesn't uh, it's a similar idea and we pass these to a solver which all the solvers know about is how to make choices from a list of options and then how to do things like remember which choices were good which choices were bad and the different algorithms do that in different ways so we've done that and so we've coded up a bunch of puzzles we've coded up a bunch of solvers so this is me uh, Matthew Crossley who's not here today uh, Martin Amos and various people in Northumbria so uh, ACO we already had we've also got a random solver it's important to check that these things are actually beating random not enough people do that and genetic algorithm and simulated annealing so Matthew wrote those uh, GAs are his thing and uh, we've got a bunch of puzzles and so kind of at the point where we've written all this code it's a fair amount it's about 6,000 lines it's not massive but uh, it's all working now we think so what we want to do is ask various questions with this and so here's a few that I've come up with we'll probably come up with more so can we learn anything about how these algorithms search a space so this is becoming a kind of research area now about understanding what these algorithms actually do um, what sort of things they how often are they wasting time going into the same area of space how much are they exploring how much are they exploiting information that they've they've learned in in various parts of the space and can we use this knowledge to predict which problems or instances of a problem an algorithm is likely to succeed at so this is another uh, fairly hot topic how do you given a particular problem and what you know about it how do you select an algorithm that is going to uh, solve that so there is a thing called the free lunch theorem which is um, says that no one algorithm will be best at everything uh, it's kind of obvious really uh, you know if you're going to solve everything you just need to look at all the possibilities whereas given the different structure of problems some algorithms will search the space in different ways and may be more suited to different problems so we're hoping to be able to um, look at the space as it's being searched kind of categorize that in some way and then uh, be able to say okay ACO is good at this kind of problem where you don't have too many local minima uh, GAs are better with this way you have a very wide flat plateau in your fitness landscape and so on okay uh, so we're also thinking we could de develop a kind of benchmark suite uh, a sort of black box optimization so um, in other areas of optimization uh, real valued there are regular competitions where people will put up a, a so-called black box so all you're given is this black box you put numbers in it returns values and you have to find the optimum value um, hasn't really been done much in these kind of combinatorial um, problems so we're thinking well maybe this is a good way to do this we I mean what kind of prompted that thought was that's what we've done here we've made a black box so maybe we can develop some kind of benchmark suite once we understand the way these things look to an optimizer we can get a set of problems that actually gives an algorithm a, a really good workout so that's uh, that's another possible avenue and then another question is why do some things seem to be much harder to solve with these things uh, they may be a similar size maybe if you sat down with a pencil you wouldn't see much difference between them but for some reason some of these things are really difficult and some of them uh, are not so um, I mean I don't think I'm gonna get insights into how a human solves them particularly but I do know that when you are looking at say if I go way back if you look at a Noikabi or a Slitherlink I know that when you get to the end toward you can apply logical things a certain amount of the way then you get to the end and you just need to kind of see it and you do see it so there's something going on maybe with pattern matching which is quite hard to uh, do with searching that's much more the case with Slitherlink which I didn't talk about but there you have to draw this uh, this loop and quite often at the end you know you think there's too many possibilities to try here I just need to kind of see it so you kind of defocus your eyes and then you grab your pencil and you go and it's done so there's something going on there in, in the brain that these algorithms is not capturing. Okay, so I'll just show you a very quick early result uh, on something that... Uh, so th one of the early things we're doing is looking at what does the search space look like. So there is a website, uh, and it's an Austrian website. It's uh, Django.at. 
Uh, it's basically all puzzles. And they're all, uh, they're all human solvable, so they're intended for people to solve. Um, if, if you're interested in pencil puzzles, that's a great place to start because it has every known form of pencil puzzle and every instance that's ever been published of them. So we scraped that website and we got 985 Sudokus, 370 Futashikis, 740 Hashis and 977 Newakabis. Uh, and then what we did was analyse the search space. And we defined the size of the search space is in this way. So what we did was we made a kind of cheating solver that knows the answer. So every time it's presented with a set of options, it knows which ones are right and which ones are wrong. So at every step, you can work out what's the probability of getting it right, what's the probability of getting it wrong. And then as you solve the puzzle, you can figure out what is the chance that uh, a random solver would have got that just by lucky choices, okay? And so that probability is P, so the size of the search space is a measure of that is one over P. So if the probability of getting it right randomly is 10 to the minus six, then we're calling the size of the space, search space a million. You need to try a million random goals. And this is what we find. So the green blobs are Futashiki, the red blobs are Sudoku. So there's only two sizes here. That's nine by nine, that's 16 by 16. Uh, orange is Hashi and blue is Nuikabi. So the first thing is this is the log of the search space size, and that's instance size linear. So the first thing is they all land under a kind of a triangle, which is nice because that means it's growing exponentially, which is kind of what we expect for these NP complete puzzles. The other thing is there's quite a lot of variation. So a lot of these puzzles which are the same size and you might think are the same difficulty, there's a huge range. So uh, if you look at these hashes, 10 by 10 hashes, they range from a search space by size of about 10 to the 8 to about 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17. That's a big number. That's a really big number. And if you look at some of the big Nuikabis and big Hashis, we're getting search space sizes of about 10 to the 70. And that is a very big number. I mean, I don't know how many, I used to know how many atoms in the universe, but it's not as many as that. <laughs> so, but then again, you look down here and you'll see that there are some that are much lower. So it kinda, it's kind of explaining really why when we looked at these Nuikabis around about here, instances of about two to three hundred um you know we were getting some success so you know we were maybe solving half of them and i'm guessing those are the half that are lying down here and not these crazy ones up here okay so we, we, we're starting to get a handle on on what's going on here um so uh, that's more or less as far as we got so the reason slither link isn't on here is because there is um an outstanding issue in how we incorporate Slitherlink because of the, the first choice you make, but that's a, a technical detail. So it's it's kind of um, it's kind of looking promising that, that we might actually get some some interesting stuff out here, but it's but it's early days. So the plan is we're going to um, uh, do a lot of experiments, uh, and then let those initial experiments kind of lead on to other experiments. When we see the answers to the first questions, we'll think of more questions, and hopefully this is going to be a, a nice study that will. Uh, kind of be sad because it probably means we'll have to stop working on this stuff and do something sensible because we won't be able to get any more papers out on it but um, I think it'll have been fun on the way and uh, that's about where it's at so uh, Sam if you want to jump up and switch the mic off I will uh, throw it open to questions Thank you.